Welcome. Uh, in this session, I'm going to talk about my time in IIT Bombay uh, from 73, 1973 when I was 16 to 1978 uh, when I was 21. So before I get started, let me tell you a little bit about IIT Bombay at that time. So IIT Bombay was based on a grant from the Russian government. Um, so different IITs have got different grants from different places. Uh, so IIT uh, Mumbai had uh, a grant from the Russian government. And it was, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, its architecture, etc. cetera, uh, reflected that at that point in time. It was a bit um, plain and simple. Um, now the IIT itself, uh, like all IITs at that time, but uh, I think IIT Mumbai or Bombay, as it was called then, uh, Madras, um, Kanpur were pretty much, I guess, in the top league as well as Delhi. Uh, so there was nothing very much to choose among these three, four IITs. Kharagpur was uh, felt to be a slightly on a lower pedestal. Um, so, um, you know, uh, and IIT uh, Bombay, what I found was that the quality of the students or my classmates was just exceptional. Uh, and that was no surprise because if you can make it through the joint entrance exam uh, of the IITs where there are, at that time, I guess there were about around 1200 people who got in uh, to all the IITs put together. And uh, probably at least uh, 100,000 applied. Uh, and so making it through that test, uh, you have to be pretty amazing. Uh, and um, so the quality of the students was very good. Um, the quality of the professors and the equipment and so on and so forth was not necessarily all that great. Um, the amount of research or anything that was coming out of, uh, um, you know, of IIT was not all that top notch. Um, later on, much, much later, I had the chance to be at Stanford. And of course, it was at a much different time and place. But my impression is that even in 73, 78, the US education system and the universities were way ahead of what was available at IIT. Yet, some of the people who have been at IIT Bombay have, uh, during that point in time, uh, you know, that uh, decade or maybe even 10, uh, you know, 20 years, 1970 to 1990, um, they have done exceptionally well. So, you know, the IITs have a lot to be proud of. Uh, but I think it was more because of the people who joined IIT as students rather than the institute itself and the faculty. Um, so, well, you know, some people may disagree with that, but like I said, uh, in these sessions, I'm going to give my sort of unvarnished uh, opinions um, and uh, not try and sugarcoat things. So let's move on. So the first thing was the admission summer. Now, if you uh, look at the previous episode, um, I had gone to Sindhya school in Guadalupe and I had done senior Cambridge there. So I had finished in 1972 in December. So I had only six months in uh, 11th standard at that time. I never did 12th. And I had a five-year course at IIT Bombay because that was the system at that time uh, that I was trying to apply for. Uh, but I had six months bef uh, between the time I left uh, Sindhya school and uh, uh, took the entrance exam. Now, during that period, I actually tried uh, and, and uh, appeared for a test and got into Agarwal classes, which was like a coaching uh, set of classes for IIT Mumbai. Now, I managed to get through that and I got a place in Agarwal classes, which was in Dadar, and we used to live uh, on Pedal Road, which was quite a distance. Uh, from Dalbert. Uh, but, um, you know, if I hadn't joined the Garwal classes, 
there is no way I would have got into IIT because the gap in my knowledge between what I had learned in Sindhya and what I needed for IIT Bombay uh, was very, very hard. Um, so I worked pretty hard in uh, these other world classes. And uh, um, I used to take the local train uh, every day at six in the morning. I used to walk down to the station, take the train, walk to the, my classes, finish the classes, walk back, then study, and so on. Um, so my father, you know, uh, at that time had uh, become a reasonably senior executive at Burma Shell in India. He had a car. Uh, I think we had a driver also at that time. Uh, we could have uh, had this driver come only and drop me at the other um, so that I wouldn't have to take the local train. But my father was a fairly tough taskmaster and kind of believed that, you know, children should be independent. They should not feel scared, you know. And um, they should take the train and take the local train. And so what people do it all the time, type of thing. And that's a little bit of that attitude has kind of even dropped on uh, for me. Uh, when I was bringing up my son, Sahil, and um, of course that was in the US, but uh, still, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, not this very molly coddling type of approach. Um, now that is, I think, good and bad, because, um, you know, I think one, because my father was so strict, and the second, because, you know, I was always in boarding, I was always a little concerned, I was always um, uh, stressed a bit uh, on this need to perform well because I felt that there was the, all these pressure of high expectations. I was also very thin, um, you know. Um, so uh, I had all these kind of things. Uh, so that uh, sort of caused some sort of mental stress for me which for a fairly long time I struggled against um, and finally sort of uh, conquered it really only after I uh, sort of retired uh, and came back to India in 2004. Uh, so why am I saying all this is that I think, you know, these days mental health, uh, stress uh, and so on and so forth are big issues. Now, how you deal with it, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, things that I think will evolve over time. Everyone is probably different. Uh, but, you know, I feel that if you can inculcate a growth mindset in your children, but also be supportive, recognize that they may have fears, be there for them, uh, is something that may be very good. I don't know how I did as a father, uh, but maybe a little better than my father, maybe. Uh, not that my father did very badly at all. Uh, I wouldn't want to project that, but uh, it's something to think about. Uh, so anyway, well, thankfully due to the bubble classes, I managed to uh, appear in the J JE and my rank was around 450 or so. Um, so I made it. Uh, an interesting story is that after I gave the first exam uh, for uh, this joint entrance exam, uh, that was the maths exam, and it is normally the toughest part of the JE, at least at that time. And if there were like about 200 or 300 people who were taking the exam at that time, um, I remember going for lunch back um, and with my father at the Bombay Gymkhana, which was very close to the test center and uh, my father asked me, how did you do? And I said, I, was, I did really bad, I think, you know, but how do you do too many of the questions? And I don't even think I should go back and give the rest of the exams. My father said, no, 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 you're stupid. You've studied a lot, you must go back uh, and do this. So I said, okay, I'll go. Now the amazing thing was like of 300 people who were there, I think less than a hundred people came back after that math exam, right? So two thirds of the people dropped out right there and then. And then of course I did a little better in physics, chemistry and English and all that, uh, which were the remaining papers. It was over two days. 
um, but I made it right now. If you have uh, because English was more like a make or pass or fail, and then you were scored on this physics, chemistry, math out of 300. But now, just imagine if you have like a hundred thousand people, and let's say even two thirds of them drop out, so you have about 30,000 odd people uh, who you're going to be competing against for 1200 places. Now, even if they're 300. Uh, marks, how many people will be there on each mark? And you know, where will the qualifying thing be? So if even if you are good, really good, but you have a bad day when you're taking that exam, you're just not going to make it, right? So making it in the GAE is, uh, unless you are like totally, you know, out of uh, the sleep, which a few people are, so those people who uh, come in the first 10 and all that are really exceptional. But beyond that, especially as you go lower and lower, it's a bit of a crapshoot as to whether you had a good day, whether you had a bad day, and whether you're going to make it or not. Anyway, so fortunately I made it. Now the interesting story um, on um, um, this whole process of after I gave the exam, uh, I have no idea when the results are going to come out exactly. Uh, I mean, so I the results had not come out. But my parents decide to go to Europe on a holiday. Now here, I'm a little stressed, though I'm not showing it that much. Um, uh, you know, am I going to get into IIT or not? Okay. Uh, then I don't know if I don't get into IIT, what am I going to do? So getting admission into these colleges is not that easy. But, you know, I have seven points. Um, in my you know, senior Cambridge, so that's pretty good. So I have a backup in Jehan College. But, you know, in terms of my father helping me select a college, you know, or helping me with the application process, and all, uh, they, he doesn't do that. And they actually go off to Europe for a holiday. Uh, and say, so you, you'll manage, don't worry, you know, you, you know you're very good. And I'm left on my own <laughs> with some friends of my parents. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm like a little concerned about my college admission. But anyway, then I get the call from IIT. So I land up for this interview. Now, in the interview, the first thing is that you've got to go through this medical. Right? And um, though I was, I think, close to my ultimate height, which is around 5 feet 10 inches. Um, I was like 99 pounds. Now you can imagine how thin that is. Um, and uh, so I, you have to go through a medical exam first. And uh, I went through that and then they told me, well, we can't admit you because you're underweight. So I said, how does weight come to it? It's like, you know, I thought I'd gone through this whole J thing, which was massive. and. You know, here I'm told now you can't get in because so then this doctor said, okay, you can go in and have some water and come here because you're right at 99 pounds, 100 pounds. Then I asked him, why do you have this weight cut off? And he said, well, you have to work in the labs and things and you pick up things like equipment and all that kind of stuff. And some of it is heavy. So, you know, we have this weight cut off. Now. So finally, I make it through that. Um, now I'm alone. There is no adult with me uh, while I'm going through all this process. Okay. Uh, then I'm standing in the line, and you know the way the process works is that uh, if you are looking for, say, computer science uh, in a particular IIT, then they keep telling you that okay, this is full, this is full, this is full. Um, uh, so out of the 473, there are some in other. Uh, interview centers because these interviews will be happening all over uh, IIT and then they keep saying, okay, you know, now computer science at IIT Kanpur is closed or computer science at uh, Madras is closed. So it's coming to you, you've got to keep thinking about all this, saying, okay, now what do I do? So by the time it came to me, uh, most of the like electrical and computer science, which were like my first choices, were closed. Uh, 
Um, so the next thing was mechanical or chemical or civil or metallurgical. Whatever. So the huge choice is that. Or you could do physics or whatever. So I had said that, okay, my next choice was mechanical. Now, just before my, and I wanted to do mechanical in IIT, Bombay. Why Bombay? Because one, my parents were in Bombay. And I had this vague, at least subconscious desire, if it wasn't very conscious, that I wanted to be in the same city as my parents. Uh, because at least then on the weekend I could be there. And you know, I'd spend so much time in Sylvia, uh, away in a boarding school. So I felt it might be a good, time, a good thing to spend a little bit of time at home. So just the person before me goes in, selects IID Bombay for mechanical, and it's announced that IID Bombay mechanical is closed. So now I get admitted to IID Kanpur in mechanical. And then I kind of, because of this thing that I want to be in Bombay, I uh, talk to my parents and then come back from um, the Europe trip. And my dad says, okay, you know, I'll try and uh, see if I can do something and get you into IIT Bombay. And then he finds out that if uh, uh, I could get a no objection certificate from uh, IIT Kanpur, then a seat had opened up in IIT Bombay, which I could get. So now I have to go to IIT Kanpur to get this no objection certificate physically. And uh, in a rush, right? so I get into this train with an unreserved ticket, and that's quite an experience because this is the first time I've traveled unreserved in a train, and uh, it's so packed that there's hardly any room to move. But somehow I get to Kanpur, I get the snow injection certificate, I come back, and I get into IIT Bombay. And then what happens is that as soon as I get into IIT Bombay, my father leaves. Uh, permission because it gets nationalized and he moves to Delhi. So all this intensive planning to get into Bombay uh, is all for nothing. But anyway, I'm now in Bombay and uh, I go to IIT Bombay. So I joined Hostel 7 and you know at that time there was this whole business of ragging and it was quite intense. Uh, sometime later, uh, not the year I joined, but the next year, uh, soon actually lost his life because uh, he was quite shy and people had wrapped a newspaper around the master to strip and then somebody lit a match in the newspaper and he didn't let the newspaper go and got burned uh, badly and then I think finally succumbed to his injuries and dragging became a big problem. But um, so the ragging in when I joined was um, a bit bad but not terrible. I mean, it wasn't like where there was a lot of physical violence. And they made us do funny things like read a physics book and after um, every 20 words say, up my whatever. And uh, uh, things like go them to a movie and uh, sit with your back uh, to the screen throughout the movie or you know, these hostel rooms have these really small alcoves. So go up, climb into the alcove and take something called a T-square, uh, which no longer exists, but at that time, and you know, that you would try and row a boat and say, I'm in Kanyakumari or I'm in Kashmir or something. So all kinds of things where you had to push a coin with your nose and um, stuff. Um, so all somewhat demeaning stuff, but uh, nothing terrible. Um, so anyway, we got through the ragging. There was this whole process of kind of growing up, uh, you know, where we had country liquor throughout. Uh, this country liquor was again an interesting story, but you know, all we could afford was this very cheap, illicit kind of liquor, um, and which could actually be poisonous. Uh, so we had this control system that we would buy a bottle of keep it for 30 days and watch the news to see if uh, nobody 
sort of there was no news of somebody passing away consuming illicit liquor. Then we'd say, okay, this is safe to drink. And then we had to drink that. And then it was you know, terrible. The smell was terrible. <laughs> I don't know how we drank it. But it was, uh, but, and uh, then, you know, we uh, drink till we threw up. But anyway, it was all part of growing up. Um, I never got into smoking really because I didn't, well, I found it difficult to uh, smoke. And I didn't like it, uh, fortunately, I guess. Um, there was also this place, so our hostel um, said, was right at the edge of the lake. And it was furthest from, or one of the furthest hostels from the main building. So we had a pretty long walk to get to our classes and a long walk back. But the location of the hostel was pretty nice. It was called Lady of the Lake. And um, uh, on this, uh, there was a, pathway to get to the rooms uh, so after you went up through the gate and there was a corner where you could sit and there was a light with really nice breeze and you could see a view of the lake and all that and that was uh, normally populated by some of the uh, people who were uh, like seniors in the hostel or later on I'll talk about it as like what we would call the lawns of the hostel in a way and that was called marine drive um, so that's something about uh, Hostel 7. Now, after the first semester in um, IIT, where I did reasonably well, and some of the things were that, you know, if you did well, really well, uh, then you could ask for a change. So if you uh, did fantastically, then you could uh, move to electronics or computer science or whatever. Uh, so initially, I thought I might try for that, but I did okay. I didn't do like exception uh, in my first semester. And then I said, I'm okay with, uh, uh, you know, not trying for that. And uh, I also like uh, had company with some of my friends and we decided that, you know, we were really interested in bridge. So for the next semester, the second semester of the year, uh, uh, we came back, my friends and me, and we played bridge morning to evening. We missed classes, but we became really good at bridge. And then we won tournaments in bridge and got winnings. And um, you can imagine that the tuition and the food costs, or what you call the hostel charges and the mess bill, was so low that I was able to afford it with my bridge winnings. And both my IIT and IIM, my father did not have to pay my college fees because I was able to uh, do various things and earn enough money to pay my own fees and tuition. So then, now this whole semester, we've not been attending classes, we've been playing bridge, and now the exams are coming. So somehow or the other, we get notes, we study for the last few days, and we managed to scrape through. So I think I got one D, uh, a couple of Cs and some Bs, um, and managed to scrape through. Um, the problem was that if you got an E or an F, then you had to repeat that course, and you, could, you had to spend the summer in it. Uh, you couldn't go home for the vacation because then you would have to study that again and then uh, pass, pass that exam. So uh, definitely wanted to avoid that. Um, fortunately, never had to spend a summer at IIT. And uh, uh, while I did pretty badly in that particular semester because I just played bridge, uh, but then I kind of said, okay, no, no, I can't do this. I need to be a little more serious. So I have to have some fun, but it's not that I'm going to cut classes or I'm not attend a single class. So I only did it for one semester. Now also, you know, in IIT Mumbai at that time. I think my friends and me, we were a little idealistic. Some of us had Marxist thoughts. Remember, we were a Russian funded university. At that time in India, there was the Nax Naxalite movement. So we used to wear kurta and jeans with a sort of jola bag uh, and long hair and a mustache. Uh, so 
um, you know, I was a little bit of a rebel, you could say, uh, at that time. But it was a phase which didn't last too long. Um, so also in India at that time, there was um, a little late. I mean, 73 was a little bit after the Vietnam War, the drug culture in the US and the sort of Woodstock and so on and so forth. So in India, it was a little bit after that, but some vestiges of that were there when I was in IIT in Mumbai and we did experiment with things like hashish and stuff like that. Um, but nothing very, very serious. Uh, never tried hot drugs, though some people did. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, that was my sort of experience in um, IIT. So also after the first year uh, that I finished um, IIT, and remember, you know, I said I was trying to like uh, earn my way, uh, do something in the summer. So with uh, my uncle, uh, I became a, a traveling salesman for his company, along with a friend of mine. Um, and the two of us, uh, he, so he was one of my closest friends, Karim Rai Singh. And uh, so his father was actually in the army and had won a Mahavir Chakra. Uh, for a battle that he fought at Nathula against the Chinese. Um, so anyway, so Karan and I, we um, uh, did this trip where uh, my uncle agreed to finance the trip uh, with not a lot of money, but we got, I, maybe we got a little bit of money besides the trip, I don't remember now. Uh, but we had to go to Bihar and Assam, all over the place, lugging this life-saving equipment. So we had quite a bit of luggage uh, because we had to give them demos and things like that. And we had to go to fertilizer factories, oil plants, and things like that uh, to give them a demo of this life-saving equipment uh, and travel. So the first thing that we saw there was the extreme amount of poverty that was there in a place like Bihar and Assam at that time. So we had not experienced that. So when I went to uh, Bihar, um, uh, we rem I remember generally seeing that the stations were becoming empty of food. So like when you were in Uttar Pradesh and all that, you could get food, yadu, something on the stations. But as you reach the station in Bihar, there's nothing. And then when we stopped at one place where we had to go to a refinery, there's this place called Munger, uh, and we were going to a refinery called Barani. Um, thing. So I had Munger. We uh, went outside the thing to have uh, food, and the food was very cheap. But you know, the dal uh, had you could see a few pieces of dal and water, and the rice was extremely coarse. So it was, and then we took a, a rickshaw, a cycle rickshaw, to reach this refinery. And I think the fare was a few rupees, and it was so hot, the tar was melting on the roads. The rickshaws was, the driver was having trouble. Um, but that was really our first exposure to um, India outside the metros and outside like Gwalior and Kishadgarh and a few places that we've been to. Now, then we reached Assam and by that time, we knew that these areas were relatively poor. So we asked for the best hotel in Kohat. And the best hotel, I mean, you know, maybe there was a better one in Bengal because we just went from the train station and, uh, was something like 10 rupees a night. And, uh, you know, there were no individual Toilets, shared toilets, pretty dirty. But that's that was it. And um, we had quite a few adventures on this trip. Um, so we tried something called tambo, which is like a raw supari, and it gives you a high. And I took that and uh, I started sweating. We were taking a train, and I sweated so much that I had to take off my t-shirt and wring it and wear it back again. Um, so I was wondering, you know, am I going to need a doctor or anything? But I was just sweating, and there was nothing else. I mean, I wasn't in pain or anything. 
Uh, my friend was a little worried. So that was one adventure. Then, you know, on the way we said, okay, we've got to stop at the Kasi Ramba because we had heard of this game park. Now, we didn't realize that it was the middle of the monsoon and Kasi Ramba was totally flooded. We had a contact of someone who had set up a lodge in Kasi Ramba who was a friend of my father's. So we visited and we said, well, I can't show you anything, you can't stay here, uh, but I can give you a meal. And uh, we had like a really good Chinese meal, which is why I cooked and we really enjoyed it. And he was saying, you know, you better hurry because the bus is going to leave. And, uh, you know, but we were enjoying it. And, you know, we said, no, 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 let's, it's okay. We'll find some way. And then we tried to hitch a ride. And somehow or the other, we made it to a point where we had to take a ferry to our next destination. And it was raining heavily, somehow or the other, we reached this place. And then we were at this Brahmaputra, which is this massive river. And we reached the point and the ferry is just leaving. So um, I think my friend jumps across with, and I'm there with the luggage. And then he persuades the ferry to come back and then I get on with the ferry because otherwise you would have been stuck at this point for a long time. Then we land up at this other place uh, where, you know, we're carrying traveler's checks because carrying cash may be risky. Now, traveler's checks, you've got to actually cash them at a bank or something like that. Um, now, we land up and we don't, rea uh, don't realize that we've landed up around the 30th of June when the banks are closed uh, for their half yearly closing. So we can't cash these travelers checks uh, in the bank and we have virtually no money. So the first thing we do is buy some peanuts. Then, you know, we start figuring out what are we going to do. And then through some contacts, some contact, we find some guy who agrees to buy the travelers checks off us for a discount and some get money to move ahead. Uh, and we cash a few travelers checks. So we had a whole bunch of adventures on this trip. It was a fantastic trip. We did like 45 days, learned a lot, had a lot of fun, and uh, went through all these kind of adventures and came back. Um, so now in the hostel, um, you know, there was this thing that if you were participating in a sort of a lot of hostel activities like you were you know active being like a secretary for the mess or you were in charge of cultural events or something like that or you were active in uh, you know a sport for the hostel or representing the hostel team and so on and so forth you earned brownie points for the hostel and um, every hostel was trying to compete with other hostels to try and attract some of the stars from the hostels to come and come into their hostels. And one of the things was what kind of a room would you get in the hostel? Because some of the rooms had better ventilation and things like that. And then there were these groups and things in the hostel. So uh, there was all this competition and, uh, you know, I was in a group which was also considered one of the star groups of the hostel. And also to some extent in these hostels, there were two groups, you know, one was people who had been to sort of English medium schools and could speak English fluently. And then there were the others who may have not been to English medium schools. They were obviously very bright because they had gone into IIT, but they were not that fluent. And then there was a third group of people who hadn't made it through the regular joint entrance exams, but got in through these quotas who used to struggle and were a little bit of a separate group. So uh, these were all, all these kind of social dynamics which were there in these hostels. Uh, but uh, we were fortunate, or rather I was fortunate to be among the hostel stores, get the best room. I was also very active writing for this hostel magazine called Spectra. And I think I wrote some pretty nasty articles on some people as well. Uh, but anyway, that was, um, you know, part of it. Um, so gradually, uh, you know, we ended up uh, becoming somewhat like the lords of the hostel, you know, the people who would sit on the main drive and uh, the people that junior people in the hostel. Would, uh, uh,
look up to. Um, so um, we were also, you know, like in IIT Mumbai, there used to be like the nerds uh, because we were uh, like the pride of female company. We were only five girls um, in our batch out of like 180, 200 or something like that. There used to be a festival called Moon Indigo where we would have some people visit the hostel and we would have some bands and uh, girls visit as well. Um, but other than that, it was a very girl-starved community. There wasn't a lot of social interaction. On weekends, some of us would go out and things like that. Uh, so um, that was what the situation was uh, like. So compared to some of the cool dudes who went to the places like Xavier's in Mumbai or Stephen's in Delhi, uh, we were quite nerdy. Now, also while I was in IIT Mumbai, um, so when I was in my third year, I think, uh, my father had this heart attack uh, and he was in Delhi. So one, of course, you know, there's this fear, um, uh, like a lot of people, I guess, have of their parent dying. Uh, so which I also had, and now this, with my father's heart attack, became more real. I also had this guilt because, you know, uh, I couldn't really leave IIT because my exams were going on. So I couldn't, couldn't visit my father in uh, Delhi. I, my father told me, you know, there's no need for you to come. But I had like a relative who was a professor in IIT and when I met him, he created a lot of guilt in me saying, your father has done his duty by saying that you shouldn't come, but now you have to do your duty by going and forget about your exam. You can try and you know, figure it out later or whatever. But anyway, my father told me no. I checked with a few other people and I didn't go to um, Delhi. But unfortunately, he recovered. But if he didn't, then I guess I would have had a lot of more guilt. Um, so then it was this whole process of accepting it, and he did very well. Um, and, you know, then you know, trying to see him deal with his heart attack was quite a learning experience for me and uh, quite educative. Uh, so one of the highlights of uh, my time at IIT Mumbai was the last year where we beat Hostel 8. Now Hostel 8 had some of the best people in IIT Bombay at various sports, things, etc. Right. So uh, we kind of um, like were a um, lot of underdogs in this hostel competition. But, and if you see a movie called Chichore, uh, I wonder whether the people who made Chichore, because it's also about this competition in Bombay, uh, whether they had actually gone to IIT Bombay <laughs> Uh, because it was very true to the kind of atmosphere that we had and how important it was winning this competition. And we were the Cinderella hostel, which actually won. And how this whole thing uh, was uh, happening. So then also now it was kind of important as to what am I going to do after IIT and whether there's a job or uh, study. So I gave these GRE, GMAT exams. I gave the common admission test at high end. Uh, and, and then I did really well in the GMAT and I filled in an application and I got accepted to Harvard with deferred admission uh, where I had to work for two years. And there was nothing mentioned as to whether I would get financial aid or not because that would be a later process. But I was guaranteed admission to the Harvard Business School. And I also got admission to IIT uh, Mumbai. So that was uh, what uh, the choices that I had before me. Now, uh, I also got into IIM and um, And I had a job with Lawson and Chudu. So now I had to decide what am I going to do? Um, I also got admission to for doing uh, further engineering. Uh, and I think Cincinnati University or something like that. So lots of choices. 
uh, and I had financial aid to do engineering. So now I'm very confused. Now, unlike students at this point in time, at that point in time, there wasn't the internet. We were very unsure. Um, I was quite young also. Um, so I asked my father and my father also didn't know him very much. He asked his friends and stuff. And the consensus turned out to be that I should join IIM Ahmedabad and not join Harvard Business School. Uh, which I think was a pretty long decision at that time. Things turned out okay, but um, I think I, if I had really known what Harvard Business School was, I could have arranged loans or funding because the other thing was um, my father couldn't afford to send both my brother and me to a... Um, and I was like uh, doing academically better than my brother. And then he was also an IIT Madras. He was keen to go overseas. I was not that keen. So there were a lot of factors uh, which were playing on this. But another very interesting thing was that if I go to the US, then maybe I will marry an American. So, and I may not come back. So this was another factor that was there. But for whatever reason, I decided to join IMM Dubai and not join Harvard Business School. Um, so who knows if I join Harvard Business School, how things would have turned out. But, uh, you know, that we will never know. So that's about it for this part of the story. And the next session will cover uh, how I joined IIT. Uh, sorry, I am in the bar and the journey there. Thank you very much for listening.